Romance at a glance. Uh huh. Romance at a glance. What you say? Romance at a glance. Go ahead, girl. Well, hello and welcome to Romance at a Glance. This is your host, Shawnee, and with me is my ever lovely co host, Bridget. How are you doing today, Bridget? I am doing so much better now that I'm speaking to you, Shani. It is a good day. Every time I talk to you, I always think of like, it's a jolly holiday with Bridget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yesterday, um, Shani was like, I have to run this idea by you really quick. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. I have five minutes. And we talked for like three hours. <laughs> We talked through both my kids' naps. Uh, my husband like kept coming out and being like, are you still talking to her? And I was like, uh, yes, I am. We have a lot to catch up on. <laughs> and it was a, a goddamn delight. It was really fun. I, the thing is, I feel like I could talk to you about anything and nothing. Like, I could easily yes. talk to you for three hours. Like, And then the thing about it is, too, is like, I don't have any kids. Like, for you, the clock is ticking. I feel like when well, we're talking... <laughs> Like, even now we're doing the podcast where it's like somebody's napping and somebody's going to wake up soon. But for me, I'm like, wow, it's Bridget time. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you come back home, they're in daycare three days a week. So three so, days a week, you, you get to have me without them. No I'm time so, limits. You know? So excited about this, Bridget. I'm so excited. I'm thank God for daycares. I seriously thank God for everyone who is daycaring, teaching, keeping all these kids happy and healthy and the real MVPs get the, the real, real MVPs, MVPs. Up. <laughs> yeah because mom's out moms and dads out here we can't we can't do this show without you guys so we really appreciate it this is when the teachers uh, need could, to go on strike teachers need to go on strike right now if they want their all their demands met go on strike right now today <laughs> today <laughs> the day school's supposed to open and every parent is looking forward to it go on strike that's when you're gonna get a real salary get paid what you're worth and all that stuff because parents and and uh, I think state governments are willing to pay teachers whatever they want right now. They're just like, please, just take these badass kids. We're sorry we didn't discipline them. We're sorry you sent them home and we didn't actually enforce the rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say a little shout out also to our new friends from around the world. Shani, yes. I have given you an update lately on where all of our new friends are from. Please, and I want to know. Of course, we have all of our friends from the United States. Hello, everyone. It's nice Hello. to see you coming back in numbers, coming back strong. Our Canadians and our friends in Central America, our friends in the Bahamas Hola. area. Ooh, Bahamas. Nice to see you all. Our Brazilian friends, welcome back. Australians, Kiwis, you guys have been here since the beginning. We appreciate you. We've got friends from Singapore from China, from India, from Israel, from Islamabad, from, ooh, hello. Look at all my Eastern Europeans. You guys, we are charting at number one in books in Macedonia. So our friends in Macedonia, Macedonia. hello, we welcome you and we thank you for getting us to number one. What an exciting day. Hello, Macedonia. And of course, we have lots of fun friends from Western Europe, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, the UK, Ireland, Sweden, Finland. You guys, this is so exciting. We have friends all around the world. We're so happy to see you. Uh, we're so happy to have you listening and uh, hanging out with us. I can't wait till like events become a thing again. And then we can like travel to different places to do like romance conferences and all sorts of other kind of things. Because I like want to meet all of these people. I'm like, where are you? And what are you listening to? Yeah. And, like, Why? and then you just ask them a million questions. <laughs> yes. I would love to be traveling the country and the world with you, Shani, and talking about smutty books with all yes. of our friends. Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys one day would like to see me and Shani in your cities, come hang out with us on Instagram at Romance at a Glance. Let us know what city... Uh, you're in or closest to maybe you're not in a city but maybe you're close to a uh, more major city and and we will start making a list and hopefully maybe 2021 maybe it'll be 2022 we don't know where the world will be we don't know but at some point we will be at a place near you yes be so so lovely and you can drink some hot chocolate with us 
You could drink some whiskey. You could drink whatever whatever beverage floats your boat. If you're a coffee drinker, we're not going to judge you. Nope. And uh, we'll probably be eating some Reese's and some cookies. Hey, Reese's, if you guys uh, want to be sponsoring podcasts, we talk about you a lot. We do. We eat a lot of Reese's. <laughs> <laughs> One day and, uh, I ate Bridget's whole bag of Reese's, by the way, and she didn't hate me. And that's when I knew we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking about hanging out and talking about books, today we are talking about Wicked and the Wallflower by Sarah McLean. And oh my goodness, I have been itching to talk to you about this book for a hot minute now, Bridget. Yes, and Sarah McLean is the co-host of another romance podcast called Faded Mates. Yeah, I mean, I heard tons and tons about the third book. So in case you guys uh, missed the reason why we're reading book number one of the Bare Knuckle Bastard series and not book number three, originally book number three just came out a few weeks ago and I was like, oh, that'd be so fun. It's getting like all these people are reviewing it and saying lots of positive things. And so I was like, Shawnee will just read book three and I'll read books one, two, and three and it'll be fun to review and see whether uh, we get the same experience when she doesn't have the backstory of books one and two. And then I read books one and two and I was like, book number three doesn't make sense at all if you haven't read books one and two. So then I changed my mind and we had to read book one first. So that is is how how we got to this point. And I'm so glad that we did. Without further ado, are you ready to get into it, Bridget? I'm ready to get pop pop poppin'. Let's get it poppin'. Romance at a glance. Uh-huh. Romance at a glance. What you say now? Romance at a glance. Go ahead, girl. Romance. You guys, when we go to our first break to do our theme song, I want you all to know that me and Shawnee dance through the theme song as if it's playing in the studio that we're in. We're not in the studio. We're in our houses. But we actually do that. We go, uh, 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 And we, like, do the little dance until it's over. And then we start as if we need to take a full break. I just want you all to know that you're missing a little dance break. So every time you hear our theme, we hope that you take a little dance break for yourself. Absolutely. So, Shani, this is obviously historical romance because season four is historical romance all the time. Fall into yes. historicals with us. And... This cover was not very historical-y feeling for me. Tell me your thoughts. Um, I mean, you guys, Shawnee is looking up the cover right now. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. That's no, why she's no. hesitating. No, no, no. I actually, I actually made notes, but I actually put the cover oh, okay. into my notes as well. So, okay. just so okay. you wouldn't talk shit about me, Bridget. Okay, <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> Bridget knows I always be looking up the cover. I'm, I always do the notes and I go, oh, I'll, I'll put the cover in before I'm done. And I never, like, put the cover in. So this week, I put the cover in. Okay. Uh, so as funny as it seems, I actually studied historical dress, like, way back in the day. Um, mm-hmm. And because I did, like, stage costuming and that sort of thing. And... I don't remember shit about most of the historical like nuances of things that I like that I learned. Um, The thing about this cover to me is like, yes, she's wearing a like historical style dress. Um, Like it's cute or whatever. It doesn't necessarily make me feel a little old timey. And I think I don't know if it's by how vibrant it is or whatever, but who knows. Um, But also, I just didn't think the cover in general let me know what I was getting in for. Like yep. what the what the story was about in general, um, the bare knuckle bastards that the whole like um, banter, the whole um, mm-hmm. crime, the crime element of the story, her being a somebody who picks locks and she's like very um, she's very inquisitive, inquisitive, yeah, and she's very like she's always like going down the rabbit hole and she's she's incredible. Like one of my favorite things, I mean, skipping forward a little bit, but one of my favorite things about her was like her appetite for everything so yes. she was like she wanted to learn more she wanted to see what was going on she wanted to like pick that lock and get behind that door and and uh she wanted more than what was her station or her place in life would have given her exactly and so like i just didn't get any of that from this cover it's a pretty cover and that's about it for me yeah i said that it was like a such a bright bold color that it made me think it was going to be like more of a modern historical like more modern ideas, perhaps in a historical romance. I see what you're saying. Um, and I thought the female, I thought the female was going to be like the main character because there's not even a guy on the cover at all, um, and that didn't really turn out to be the case because that's obviously about him and his 
um, his brothers and his um, chosen sister. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll give you a quick synopsis of the old plot, Daru, hey. and it is that Devil, or Devin is his real name, but everyone calls him Devil, is a bastard son of a duke, and he is a king of the rookery. And he rules the rookery, which is like one of the, um, back in the historical times, if you're not a historical reader like me, um, but I obviously figured it out from the story, the rookery is essentially like the slums. So he and his brother, who's called Beast, uh, whose real name is Wit, they rule the streets together. And they are, they have sort of, uh, through scrapping and they were bare knuckle <clears throat> boxing fighters for a long time. That's how they started making their money and their mark. They and their sister from another mister. They, and another mom, actually. They don't share any parents. <laughs> they, 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 um, the three of them together have risen, you know, over the decades to rule the slums as the unequivocal kings and queens. And they had another brother, another bastard. And they ha- the, this book for me had, there's kind of a lot of plot that they have to get through in the beginning of this book to like get you going. So basically there were three boys born on the exact same day, all bastards to a duke. And he had one daughter who should have been legitimate, but the mom cheated. So he has one daughter he claims as his le- heir, except for that he tells everyone when she's born that it's a boy. And then he gets these boys when they're like 10 years old and brings them to his mansion um, or country estate. And he essentially like child abuses them and beats them and pits them against each other so that they have to fight to become the next Duke. So whoever wins these years of battles will become the next Duke and the other two will be cast off or killed or whatever. And the girl is also there, and she ends up, they all end up becoming friends and protecting each other as much as possible. And one of the boys falls in love with Grace. And he, the one who falls for Grace, ends up becoming Ewan, the Duke. And the other three run together away from Duke Daddy. Yeah. And they have to live by their wits and their fists. And that's kind of where we come to is that before the current Duke, whose name is Ewan, before he becomes the Duke, they all promise that no matter who wins the dukedom, there will never be an heir. So they will, they will beat their father that way by never having an heir. And when they hear, when devil hears that he's back and looking for a wife, him and Beast decide that it's time to go a call it. That's kind of where our story begins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's very interesting how um, how the story starts. I liked how the story started with um, mm-hmm. Felicity, like, hiding out in this, you know, room because she was being bullied. Um, and... Mm-hmm. Then Devil finds her there because Devil and Wit are hanging out just waiting for Ewan. Or they're hanging out, I think, just to break into the place and find Ewan. Yeah. But yep. then they, he ends up running into Felicity. And I actually think this is one of the funniest scenes in in the book. I like how it started. It kind of set the tone for me. Um, I wish yep. the, to- the tone... I, fe- I felt like I wanted the same tone of this first scene to last throughout the book. Devil is talking to Felicity. Well, she's talking to herself. And then he's like, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't say anything. And then he says something. (laughs) And then Wit is also there hiding in the background, just doing Nightingale calls. And I just imagine he's trying to get Dev to leave the situation the whole time. Like, and essentially like, you know, doing bird calls like. (laughs) (laughs) I thought that was hysterical. I love like their silent. So Wit, um, his character almost never speaks the entire book. He speaks Mm -hmm. very, very little. He does like a one sentence thing later and both his sister and brother are like, holy shit, that's the most we've heard you talk in decades. Like, he just (laughs) doesn't talk. But he's constantly, like Shawnee said, he's doing like nightingale calls or he's like, he's like giving them a look or like clearing his throat. Like he's saying a lot without saying anything. Yeah. And same with Dev, like when they're speaking to each other, he'll like tap his cane on his toe and they all know what that means. And I loved all of those little quirks 
I thought those were really great part of the book. Well, the, I think uh, the world building for me was really nice. I had got a really great picture of what everything looked like from um, Felicity's world of the aristocracy, her family, the kind of the way her family operates and kind of how fucked up they are when they're trying to like sell mm-hmm. her basically mm-hmm. uh, to get her married because they're broken, but they don't tell her that they're broke um, to the rookery to Dev and Wit and Grace's operation to the ice um, to where to the ice hold um, to the carts that are, are um, smuggling contraband. Like they really built this world. And I really felt like, the way they describe Dev um, being the kind of kingpin of this world. And when he, um, when Felicity goes to actually visit him in the rookery and then she leaves and ends up getting her purse stolen and then giving away all her hairpins and, um, you know, basically, and then a guy's trying to rape her or attack her in some way. Um, And then Dev comes and shuts it down. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I love a good, like, I love that trope of like a guy saving the girl from like a, uh, you know, something happening, but it's not always mm-hmm. done. It's not always done well. Like, like, so mm-hmm. I, I like it 50% of the time, uh, but I liked it in this book because it, sh- it was used to show that he was like at a word, he could shut down this whole place. He could like, he just yelled into the rafters, like, she's mine, she's mine, she's mine. And then everybody in the rookery knew not to touch her and to let her have, like, free yeah. reign to go wherever she pleased and however she pleased. Um, so it gave me a great sense of how powerful he was in this place. Now, I wanted yep. him to keep this toughness throughout the story. Like, I wanted him to just be that fool who's shutting shit down all the time. Like, I wanted that energy. Mm-hmm. And I didn't mm-hmm. feel like I got that energy the whole book. And I was like, I wanted it. Like, I wanted it so bad. <laughs> I I agree because I, I did think there was too much, especially in like, I'll say like the middle third of the book. There was much too much of him like constantly trying to push her away and being like, she's too good for me. She lives in the light. I'm in the darkness. I'm not good enough. And I was like, get over it, mofo. Like, she wants to be in the darkness. You bring that bitch into the darkness with you and you ravish her. She wants to be ravished. You ravish her. You ravish her. Don't deny someone who wants a ravishing. You ravish if she wants to be ravished. If she says um, she wants it, if she says she needs, give it to her, please. Give it to her, please. (laughs) And I, Shani, I knew the second I saw that he had a pimp cane, though, I was like, oh, Shani's going to be all over him. I love a man a cane. with a cane who's a boss. I was like, Shani's I love, gonna I, love, I love him. a cane weapon. I love a cane weapon. You know, I love those. I love all those mafia books. I love all those yep. freaking Dawn books. Speaking speaking of mafia, let, let's let's take a tangent. We're going to take a tangent real quick. OK, um, please. 365 days on Netflix, Bridget. Okay. Yes, tell me about it. Okay, so I have not watched it <laughs> because I want to watch it with you. But dear listeners, um, it is a romance novel that got made into a movie. It's a mafia okay. dark romance. And it's basically about this mafia kingpin who saw this girl years ago and he saw her like when he was about to die. And so for three years, he's been like tracking her down. Um and so he decides to just kidnap her and and um he says to her basically something like i will i'm going to keep you for 365 days um and that's how long i have to make you fall in love with me right and she's not about it <laughs> or whatever and uh so it's them kind of fighting it is a dark romance um i think it's a trilogy so this is actually book 1 this movie is book 1 um but it's been, I, even though it has, like, terrible reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, forget about it, because any romance novel is going to have terrible reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. But the world of TikTok and, like, women all over are going crazy for it. That's how I heard about it. Everybody was like, you got to watch it. You got to watch it. So I started to watch it, and then I was like, oh, no, no, no. I got to wait for Bridget. I got to wait for Bridget to watch it. <laughs> um, I'm into but, it. Let's watch it. You know what I'm saying? So we got to watch it. Um, and we're thinking of doing a watch along um, with our patrons or our listeners. Um, so hit us up on Instagram if you want to watch a smutty movie with us because uh, this is happening. 
This is happening. I, I'm for it. I'm for it. I, even if it's a bad movie, I love to watch bad movies if I know it's going to be bad. So even if it's bad, I'll still enjoy it because we'll be able to talk about it during it. That's the funniest and thing. Watching a bad movie. Yeah. Watching a bad movie with a friend is hilarious and one of the most fun things it's you so can funny. do. <laughs> Just know that Bridget and I, when we watch a movie, when we do a watch along, watch a movie, we pause the movie at certain points so we could talk. <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk shit about the movie. So if you do watch along with us, don't think you're going to like leisurely enjoy a movie straight with, all the way through. Talking is encouraged yeah. and we will pause the movie. Yes. We'll even rewind so we can see a part again um, just so we can yes. talk junk about it. We've done this before and it is super fun. So definitely hit us up on Instagram because this has to happen and we got to watch Schmutz together. It's going to happen. It's a bonding experience yeah, let's, to watch Schmutz together. Let's, uh, let's just like assume... That we're going to watch it at the end of September. So if you guys want to be a party to watching along with us at the end of September, let us know. And we'll figure out how to work it out. Woohoo. Okay, talking about smut, Johnny. Yes. Um, I know we're skipping for it a little bit. Because I do want to just quick note that I love the banter. I thought they had good banter. I love Felicity in general. I thought she was dope. Like, when she shows up at the rookery and he's like, you're not supposed to come to me. She's like, why not? I needed to see you. <laughs> like, I just love that she's like, uh, that's dumb. Um, and I love that she's, like, constantly trying to, like, lockpick everything. And she, like, lockpicks his unpickable lock. And I just think, I just thought she was a treasure. I loved her. Um, I did like spoiler. that she's always breaking out of her house as well. Always breaking out of her house. Just like, like she's doing a lot of things. Yeah. Um, I also loved that he was uh, giving her the old uh, cunnilingus on a couple occasions. Yes. And I was yes. like, look at you getting down in the garden. Look at you getting down in the ice house. Like, look at you. Okay. I see you I guys. love how the getting world is their oyster. <laughs> Yeah, um, And then also one thing I appreciate and especially like um, having read some of the books we've read that have no sex or like sex in the very, 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 very end of the book. Like the one thing I really loved about this book is that they have sex at the very end of the book. Like it's it's the book's almost done when they finally bang. But they have mm-hmm. so many great like sexual experiences leading up to that and sex play and yeah. foreplay and tension leading yeah. up to that, that I don't care that it's at the very end of the book that it's happening. You know, yep. I was like, yes, lick it. Where are you licking now, Dev? Oh, lick it again. <laughs> lick it again. <laughs> yes. So yes. That, was, that was really cool. And I, I'm with you because I like how Felicity was um, always like, no, I'm going to do this thing because I want to. I'm going to do this thing, even to her own detriment, a a few times. Yeah, even to her own. Like, yeah, like if Dev hadn't saved her, like, you know, she. she She's like, I'm going to walk home in in the rookery. And then all of a sudden she's got no money, no nothing. (laughs) She's like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What um what did you think about the whispering bench scene before even before he goes down on her? Oh, I just thought that was cute. I first I thought that was so I love the idea of the whispering bench itself. Like, I felt like that set Mm -hmm. such a great mood and tone for what was going to happen. And in my mind, I was like, I want a whispering bench. What do I get? What does one get a whispering bench? So the, dear listeners, the whispering bench is this bench where if you sit on opposite sides of it, it's curved. You can, even if you're whispering, you can hear exactly what the other person is saying. So they sit far apart on the bench and they whisper to each other as like the foreplay. And... It was great. It was very well done. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was. It I was really nice. Quite a bit. I mean, I enjoyed their their tension, um, but I definitely did not enjoy the back and forth of "You're too good for me." No, no, you. Oh yes, yeah, you are. Like, I am. cut it I out. I was like, oh, cut it this, out. This is going on way too long. I'm gonna need y'all way to get long. it together. <laughs> yeah, and I think partially it was just because it was a really long book, and because it had so much backstory and so much like world building for books two and three. Yeah. And so I feel like part of it was just like, oh, they can't get together yet. But I'll, I always feel like characters can get together earlier and have their happily ever after at 75% if they're still then going to work together to like combat whatever the external 
thing was. Thing you know is, what I mean? Like yeah. they, you can have them get together earlier and then have that external thing be the thing that like they're working to get past. Still, I, I like um, also when books are when characters are working in their own relationship, right? So like everything always mm-hmm. has to be some big plot point, like someone's trying to kill them or someone's whatever. But I actually mm-hmm. like, like a lot of the Highland books, right, are about kind of these forced marriages. Um, and a lot of the time it's about the couple getting to know each other and compromising and figuring things out, them pissing each other off and them having to work it through. And I actually like that as a plot point. Like you mm-hmm. generally don't see your characters arguing. Like in this book, I mean, they don't really argue about couples things. They argue about some major big fucked up things, but not just like little couples things. And I, I enjoyed that kind of nuance of growing with a character. I think it shows mm-hmm. me how they're following, falling in love. When she has a complaint and he listens or adjusts to that, I mean, that's sexy to me. And I'm like, and that's also because I'm older now and I've been through some relationships and I'm like, look, a fool who'll just listen, like that shit is <laughs> sexy. <laughs> He hears you and makes adjustments. Sexy, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I liked that she was not super young. In some of these historicals, it's like they're 19 years old and they just came out in society. And I'm like, woo, yeah, she's young. She's definitely still a virgin. Yeah, it's nice that she's like a spinster, but she's 27, so she like knows who she is. She's got her life together. I mean, aside from like having no, you know, control of her life. Um, one thing I did want to mention is her family is the worst. Not the worst, <laughs> but they're, like, close to the worst because they're basically trying to sell her into marriage without telling her that they have to sell her into marriage because they have no money. And, like, the dad knows it, the brother knows it, the mom knows it. No one tells her. She probably would have gotten married and just, like, sucked it up for them if they had just said, hey, you have to do this. She would have been like, okay, fine. Yeah. Um, But they don't tell her. They lie to her. So she's like, well, I'm not going to marry that dude. Like, he sucks. Like, oh, I don't have to. We have plenty of money. And they don't tell her. And then it's like, crickets, crickets. Okay, so the thing that I think is super fucked up but also tells me that there's another series that uh, this book is referencing is they tried to marry her off to a duke who was already married. Um, the Duke was getting divorced, even though he was heavily in love with his wife. And so they held some sort of contest and she was a part of this contest. And I guess at this point, the Duke told her how much he was still in love with his wife. And this is actually how she ends up getting ruined uh, or like becoming undesirable is because she took part in this contest. Obviously, she didn't win. The Duke stayed with his wife that he loved. And now she's kind of an outcast and at the... uh, at the border of society. Every time she goes to the parties and things, her friends are not her friends anymore. And she just wants to be back in. Um, But I think it's really messed up and shows how desperate the family was. And also just how messed up that they didn't tell her that they had her competing for this Duke because they were broke. And like, how embarrassing. Like when I was reading that, I was so embarrassed for her. This idea of like competing for a Duke who's already married. Like, I don't know. I just... I was like, man, I would have to. I was like, your families do pretty fucked up things to each other, but this is really fucked up. <laughs> no, so what I didn't even realize until researching the book afterwards is that she's a character in these all these other books. Because when I was reading through the reviews to try and find my favorite review, a bunch of people were talking about how she was in the previous books and they already kind of knew her character. And I'm actually glad that I didn't read anything with her in it previously because I don't know that I would have liked this book as much if I already knew about all those other side characters. Like, I feel like part of the reason I really liked this is because I was like, ooh, it's all fresh. It's all new. I love the bare knuckle bastards. Like, what a fun world. Oh, she's such a fun heroine. Um, Yeah, her family's a piece of shit and she has this crazy backstory as to why she's ruined. But whatever, that's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't, I mean, in general, when somebody says a book is a standalone, like, I just prefer that I'm not given all these references to let me know that I'm missing out on a whole other story. Like, that that kind of bothers me sometimes. Um, But like, and then I have to hear about, it's a standalone because you're going to explain to me what happened in this books I didn't read in the story, which is what happened. They took time to explain how she was with this Duke and blah, 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 blah. And then that was all exposition. Like it was not like delivered in like the coolest way ever. Um, so that was just a, a note. I'm not like super like upset about it, but 
Like, I notice it. I'm like, mm. It does bring me back to the beginning of the book where, so after she meets Devil on the balcony and Wit is like whistling at him, like, yo, bro, wrap it up. Stop talking to this lady. She goes back into the wall room and she's sort of preyed upon by her former friends who are now her enemies, who've always been bullies, but she used to just be their friend, so they didn't bully her. And she basically just, like, snaps and can't take it anymore. (laughs) And one of the women is unmarried, and she's like, oh, well, I guess you're trying to get the Duke. Well, you can't have him because I already landed him. And then she, like, walks away, and then the whole time is like, oh, my God, what did I say? Oh, my God, what did I say? And I was like, (laughs) can relate so deeply to saying something like, oh, yeah, well, I already got first place. And you just, like, walk away, and you're like, I didn't get first place. What the fuck am I talking about? (laughs) I thought that was wonderful that she was just like, oh, God, well, now no one will ever talk to me and I'll be the laughing stock for the rest of my life. He's never even met me. Of course, we're not going to get married. Um, And it must have seemed like such a miracle when devil was in her room and offering her everything she ever wanted. Like a true devil. Like (laughs) like a true devil. Yeah. And also, I like that scene when he's in her room. I like their banter because like when they're talking, he's trying to get information from her. She's trying to get information from him. And she's uh, holding her own in this conversation, even though he's supposed to be this big bad devil, or whatever. Like she's like, "Who are you?" He's like, "Who are you?" She's like, "Who are you?" <laughs> like you were in my room. I'm not used to having people just climb up into my bedroom. So we gonna have to uh, have an exchange. I need you, you know. And I also like that she um, extracts the promise from him when they make their deal. That he's like, "Okay, yeah, I'll get you into or the Duke to you know agree to this marriage." for you and she's like okay but if you don't like i get something from you like you have to promise me a favor um and i like that she does that so it's not just like this one-sided situation um and i was like go ahead felicity go ahead all right i see you um (laughs) and uh i i just really enjoyed that um that dark kind of menacing feel like when he's in her bedroom like i i enjoy that Mm -hmm. oh yeah i was like oh that's catnip i was like oh he's in there he's handsome oh 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 oh. what's What's gonna gonna happen happen? what's gonna happen that's the thing if if an author can make you feel like what's what's about to happen like that's a sexy feeling to stand on the edge of the cliff i i thought in general the whole uh wit and grace and him like together like had a great feeling of like love, but also menace and like they're willing to do anything to save themselves yeah. and each other. And I liked that. Um, I liked how much they like protected and they're like, you know, Gracie, you better get out of here. And like how much they're willing to sacrifice to keep her away from Ewan. I did feel like Ewan and until the very end of the book, he was actually not that bad of a character to Felicity. Well, I feel like he's going to get his own love story. I mean, I don't know, but he 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 get he him and Grace are the love story. Of oh, the okay, third book. so so there it is. So like, I was like, they can't make him that bad because he's going to get his own love story. Like, I didn't know that they had a book, but I, it was pretty clear because he doesn't do anything like other than I, get, I mean, he does try to like kill devil well, at the end and lock him in an ice cave but aside from that well, he doesn't what, do but up, but up until that point but i think i felt i felt like right. at that point devil kind of deserved it like i mean well that was like after they said that she was dead yeah. right so so yeah. but the he just, he just snapped yeah so like i didn't feel like it was unjustified the, i don't feel like the end of the book was unjustified from you and so I was kind of like, well, y'all kind of drove him. Like, I know y'all have your beef from the past, but at this point, Dev to me is the instigator of everything. You know what I mean? Ewan is mm-hmm. just like trying to live his best life. And yes, he wants grace, but he's not overtly doing anything super, you know, whatever to them. Um, so at the end, I was just kind of like, well, I mean, you kind of did push this guy over the edge until, you know, you get yeah. kidnapped and. You told him the you told him the one thing that he's been looking for. I mean, perhaps for bad reasons yeah. we don't know, but like the one thing he's been looking for is <laughs> that <dead>. exactly. <laughs> like, I would just, like I also thought that it was a cute scene um, when Felicity is breaking up with him and she tells him that uh, she's in love and he's like, "What is that? Like, what is love? What does it feel like for you? Like, you know?" I just like that scene. It was a very um, 
it was a very visceral scene, and I I've had that same. I've said that same thing to people who are like, "Oh, I'm so in love with whatever," and like I'm like. Yes, but what is that? What is that thing that you're talking about? What does it feel like for another person, like, to love someone? You know what I mean? And then I feel like until you actually feel what that feels like, nobody can quantify that for you. Nobody can explain to you what Mm -hmm. love feels like until you have felt it for yourself. And it's something you will never be able to explain to another human. (laughs) And especially if you grew up without seeing it. So like you had no way to know, like no way to see it or notice it or understand it like as a third party person. Cause like he grew up in the brothel. He didn't have anyone like, you know, no one was like in love with him or loving him as a child. And then he met Grace, but like that whole period where he was falling in love with her as, you know, a young child and early adolescent, um, he was like, you know, trying to survive and trying to not die and trying not to kill his brothers on accident and feeling like he was in charge of them. And, um, you know, and then his dad, like, you know, continued to child abuse him and to mentally abuse him and stuff for, you know, presumably until he died because it's not like he became a good guy, we assume. So it's like he, and he's been alone. So it's like real hard for him to know what love is when he doesn't get to be a part of it. And, like, Devil and Wit and Grace, like, they ended up together. So they got to experience, like, the love of siblings and being each other's confidants and protectors. And he didn't... He was, like, alone. Yeah. Um, I felt like he... So... The other thing about Ewan is that he had that for a minute with his brothers and his sister, um, cause he wasn't, I mean, he didn't attack them right off the bat when they were all pitted against each other. He was part of the team mm-hmm. until the very mm-hmm. end, you know? So I think mm-hmm. that there's also a part of him that has felt a tiny bit of love, you know, and then mm-hmm. had it taken away. Yeah. And that also yep. kind of, I think, adds to the feeling of yearning for like, what more can love be? Like if, if this had continued, if I was still part of the crew, like what more could love have been for him? Um, But you brought up brothels a minute ago. And so I was going to say, let's talk about the brothel. Okay. (laughs) When uh, Felicity goes to the brothel, um, when Dev Mm -hmm. doesn't want to talk to her anymore, he's like, this is our last meeting. We're Mm -hmm. not going to meet anymore for like, ugh, so many times. Um, and so she goes yeah. to the brothel, and then Deb's like, wait, what? Where is she? <laughs> yeah. How'd you feel about that? <laughs> I loved it. And I love that the sister owned it. I love that it was a brothel for yes. women of the aristocracy. Like, I loved how, like, wide her eyes yeah. were there. She was like, oh, my God, this is great. Like, she wasn't like, oh, this is scandalous. She was like, oh, hello. hello. <laughs> what is happening here? Um I also like, you know, I always think it's nice when there's, you know, if someone's going to be an idiot when they have, like when the female character doesn't just like sit around when she's like, well, fuck you then, bro. Mm, Go to this brothel and visit your sister. And um, I thought it was great. I liked the description of the brothel. I liked the world of it. Um, Obviously, I've read books two and three, so I now know that we get to see more of it in books two and three. Um, But I thought it was, I mean, it was like another portion of their sort of empire of... Uh, shady dealings that I I loved. Yeah, that was good. I I really liked Grace in general because um, I felt like she was really the boss of everyone. You know, mm-hmm. like Dev Dev thinks he's the boss. Wit thinks he's the boss. No, Grace was really the boss because at any moment, if Grace said no to anything, everything would shut down. Like, you know what I mean? And you got that impression, yep. um, and you got the impression that she did what she wanted to do. And I think it was also a cool scene when she reads in the newspaper um, that Ewan is getting married to Felicity um, and she comes to them and she's like, are you guys idiots? Did you think I wasn't going to read the paper? Did you think that you were going to get away with this? Like, what did you think was going to happen when they announced this? Like, 
the fact that yeah. you guys didn't tell me is not going to change anything. She's like, you idiots, I'm worlds ahead of you. Like, I just love when yeah. she just, like, sets them down. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, and she's like, and my, my, my edict still stands. He doesn't die. Neither of you are allowed to kill him. <laughs> and she's just like, no one's allowed to harm him except for me. And I'm like, get him. Get him. Which get makes him. sense because, like, in the beginning of the book, I'm like, why aren't they just killing him? Like, Dev is supposed to be this hard ass, whatever. He's, I'm assuming he's killed people mm-hmm. before because people are so scared of him. So, you know, sure. and then, like, they, they even imply, like, he let that guy live who tried to touch Felicity. And, and they're like, you, you know, they basically say, gone yeah, soft. you've gone soft. <laughs> so I'm very much assuming, and probably rightfully so, that he has killed people. So uh, yeah. the fact that they don't kill Ewan for part of the book annoyed me. I was like, I don't understand. You broke into his house just to, to, you know, tell him, threaten him. Like, why wouldn't you just end it right there? And he talks about ending it right there. And I'm like, come on, you pussy ass bitch. End this shit. Like, that's, <laughs> that's how I felt about it. So the fact that she was like, no, you're not allowed to kill him. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Grace is the barrier between mm-hmm. why oh, they're yeah. not uh, ending this whole scenario. Because I'm like, are you going to watch this man his whole life to make sure he doesn't have an heir? That doesn't make any sense to your happiness. Yes. yes, I was really excited after reading this book to get to book two and three. Because I was... Like, I was totally on board with the other two characters, like, Wit and Grace. I was like, they're just great characters. And I was excited to read their romances as well. So, as we said, uh, Devil acts, like, kind of a little bitch and tells uh, him and Beast tell Ewan that Grace is dead. And Ewan, like, loses his mind and beats Devil within an inch of his life and leaves him in the ice cave locked up. And thankfully, uh, Felicity never listens to him and is coming back to see him and pick the locks <laughs> to see him again. And she ends up saving him with her lock picking skills. Uh, I just, I liked her lock picking because I feel like I've never read a book where that's just like a main, certainly not in any of the historicals reading, but like a main character trait. Yeah. Like we've read lots of books where it's like, uh, the main character is like more learned or she's like really likes animals or she really likes, you know, whatever. Some other, like she really likes horseback riding, uh, not side sail, yeah. or she really wants to become a professor or whatever. Um, but th- I felt like this was such a specific and like useful skill to learn, but that you would never, like no lady of the gendry would ever have a chance to learn yeah. I, I well liked it. the thing it is a, i really detail. like the skill but my brain says to me how like how did she learn you know like where and because she is so learned in lock picking i'm kind of like i wish they had kind of mentioned like how she i just i just assume that she always has hairpins yeah. and she's just nosy and so she just always was trying to figure it out and jimmying locks yeah. at her house and like jimmying the locks to get in her brother's room and jimmying well, the locks. At, so I just assumed that she was like, oh, <laughs> but just like just like figuring it out until she figured well, out. Which is kind of know, what I assume because worked. like when we were kids, my siblings and I were really great at getting through locks. Don't ask me why. Don't ask too many questions. But my, because my parents were so strict – we would figure out ways of getting into everything. Like, even, like, password protected, um, like, the password for the computer, right? My parents are super strict. The computer had to be in a central location in the living room, like, so they could monitor everything that was happening, and it was password, and you had to go get my dad to put the password in the computer. Well, I learned very early on that if I gave my dad, like, a bag of chips, right, it would make his fingers greasy. And then I, I would give him something greasy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would ask him to put the password in the computer. And then I could see exactly what letters he typed. And then I would take the letters to my siblings and be like, okay, here's the letters. Help me decode this, this whatever word this is or whatever. <laughs> Your childhood is crazy. My childhood was finding out ways, like, the ingenuity of, ha- like, life hacking every scenario and i'm still like this yeah if you guys are if you guys are parents out there new or or have children like in the house still or whatever they're not already grown 
me and Shawnee are the perfect <laughs> example as to why you should give your kids way more trust and rope. Because I never did any of this shit because I didn't have to. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, like, we didn't have to go investigate anything. I mean, we still, like, got into trouble like little kids are wanting yeah. to do. But, like, we weren't, like, decoding the password for the computer because there was no password. We were just allowed to be on the computer you know, within the certain windows of time that we were allowed yeah. to have. But, like, it wasn't a big... It wasn't a big to-do. It wasn't a big... We were allowed to read whatever we wanted, so we didn't have to hide books. Like, we were... We just... Bridget. You know, we didn't have to sneak out you ever. You'll never understand just, you know. the, the, the point, man. I think there's a lot of... I think there's, like, a, <laughs> one, a lot of immigrant families that can resonate. Like, every time I watch, like... Uh, um, oh, for sure. Leo's like show, this. Yeah, like, been, yeah, any show with, like, uh, um, like over, like, uh, like Korean parents who are over, uh, like, like uh, fresh off the boat. Or, like, um, when you see Nigerian parents, like, shows with Nigerian parents. I'm like, my parents aren't Nigerian or Korean. But everything that those parents do was, like, exactly what my parents did. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad's uh, Costa Rican. But it's actually my mom, who's American, who is just as strict as all of these parents. So, like, it's... I When I explain stuff like this to people sometimes, I'm like, I think they think I'm insane. Like, what we had to do to finagle around scenarios and, and things like that. And we would have to figure out how to get doors open or how to, like, tape the doors down so that when my dad closed it, it wouldn't really lock. Or, like, you know, stuff like that in order to get around yeah. everything. Um, but when – so so I understand, like, the thought of Felicity, like, going, um, like, lockpicking because she just thinks it's fun. But at a certain point, she's actually talking about it, like, what's happening, the tumblers and this and that. And that which means that she, like, kind of studied locks at some point. Like, she opened up a book – at some point, figured out all the mechanisms. But she's also, like, rich. She's rich enough that she could get a yeah, book. Yeah, Which I just kind of wish that they had kind of given, like, they have kind of said that, you know? Yeah. And they're like, sure. like oh, well, you know, I got, you know, I saved up or I snuck this book and whatever. Um, because it just kind of looked like she just had this talent and, and I didn't know where exactly it was coming from. And for a lady of the gentry, I'm like... I wonder if it. I wonder if they talk about it though in the previous. That's books. what I'm wondering. But then, to me, when stuff is in a previous book and not in this book, then it's not a standalone. Well, yeah, yeah. This is in its own series. Then it's like this should be book five of Ex- that series exactly. or something like that. You know what I mean? And so right. that's that's the only thing where I was like, where did this locks picking skill just come from? She just she just got hairpins one day and now she's great at it. Like I did want to know. Like how it, I like I like the explanation. She was like, "Doors always locked to me," and so I always like the idea that I can open a lock. Like I like that explanation, but just give me like a little bit more of like, "You're a lady of the gentry. Lock picking is not a default for you." So how did no? You'd have to try hard. Yeah, to how did this out. happen? Like you know what I mean? So so there was that uh, element of the lock picking that I I was a little bit like. Mm. <laughs> But I like that she did it. I like that nobody noticed her sneaking out of the house in the middle of the night. Every time I was like, you're just leaving. You, you're in the rookery every night, sneaking over to Debs, and, like, nobody checking in on you. Wait wait till – so when you read the second book, the se- and I – after we come back from our break, you guys, I'm going to tell Shawnee a very smutty story from Ooh. book two. But book two, the main character is also on the shelf – and she's like, nobody cares because I'm on yeah. the shelf. So, like, they're not trying to, like, protect my virtue anymore because I've already been on the shelf for so long. They don't think anyone's going to marry me anyways. <laughs> so, so, like, sad. basically, like, no one's, no one's, like, yeah, no one's checking for yeah. me anymore because they just, like, A, they don't think I'm going to sneak out anyways. And also, they don't think uh, anyone's going to yeah. care. So. All right, Chani, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about about the book? Otherwise, I think we should take a quick break. Um, yes. So I did want to talk about the end of the book before we go into our ratings and all that stuff. Um, I did want to talk about this one thing that happened at the very end, right? So, like, I'm bringing this up because I want all the listeners in the world to know, like, don't do this, okay? Um, so when... okay. When Felicity actually ends up having sex with Dev, right? He he yes. says to her, "I can give you nothing. This will lead to nothing. We will go nowhere. Like that's what this is." And she's like, "Yes, I hear you. Yes, yes, Dev. Of course, nothing." 
And then in her mind, she's like, <laughs> I wrote this quote because I was like, oh my God. Um, and the quote is, it would not end with him leaving her. It would end with marriage, a partnership, a line of children with beautiful amber eyes and strong shoulders and long straight noses. And I was like, Felicity girl, he just said he's not about to give you oh, nothing. No. Like, <laughs> yep. and she... I do I do worry about people in general because I've had many friends who the guy's like, I don't want a wife or I don't want a girlfriend. And she's like, we're going to get married. And I'm like, mm, this rarely <laughs> works, let me tell you. And I'll only say rarely because actually this sort of happened to me. But like in general, <laughs> all my friends have always told me this. They're like, this is, oh, I, I found this guy. He's such a great guy. We're just keeping it casual. But I know that it's going to be more. I can feel it. I And I'm like, no, but he told you it's not going to be anything. Like he said those words to you and you're building a world in your mind that does not exist. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I have been adamant about this one thing, which is like, if you're dating someone, specify that what's happening. If this is your boyfriend, then he should ask to be your boyfriend. Or if you want to ask to be his girlfriend, you should ask to be his girlfriend and to be exclusive if that's what you mean to do. Don't just roll into things, you know? And so I had this um, with my... Or don't assume or don't assume what's happening if you haven't cleared exactly. it up. Because I have a bunch of friends who are like, no, we're totally exclusive. And I'm like, mm, do, did you talk about it? Yeah. Because I don't know that that person thinks that you guys are exclusively dating yet. In fact, I know because I saw them date exactly. someone else. And I thought you'd be cool with it because you told me you were casual. And casual doesn't mean exclusive necessarily. Exactly. And the thing yeah. is, Danger. I had that with like both my partners I have now. I remember with uh, Brendan one day, he we said something and I was like, oh, no, I have a date tonight. <laughs> And he was like, what? I thought we were dating. I was like, did you ask me? Did we ever? And he was like, well, I'm asking you now. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, if you didn't ask, then don't assume because I'm not your girlfriend until I say I'm your girlfriend. And we're not exclusive until I say we're exclusive. Um, and the funny thing about that, too, is that with my second partner, we were actually in the same in this scenario where we were only supposed to be play partners. Right. He was like, I don't want anything serious. And I was like, I don't want anything serious either. So we were just play partners. And there was a certain point where things changed, where we could feel it changing um, or whatever. And we talked about it, but it was never like something that was specified. But I knew there was something more and he knew there was something more. Um, And so I told him one day, I was like, I'm not about this gray area. I was like, I know I know we both feel it. We've kind of talked about it and we've danced around it. But here's X, Y, Z. And I need to know if you are also X, Y, (laughs) Z. You know, or whatever. And he was like, well, I just assumed we were X, Y, Z. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. You need to say X, Y, Z if you want to be X, Y, Z, (laughs) you know. And so that so that happened. But that we did, you know, I did feel that way where I was like, oh, no, there's something more here. I felt the amber in the eyes, maybe not the children part, but, you know. (laughs) Um, And so I would just I, I bring this up just to say, dear listeners, okay, romance besties. Specify what you guard your hearts. Guard your, I, honestly, I don't even say guard your heart because guarding my heart was the terrible thing I did. You don't have to guard your heart, you just have to spe- be specific with your heart. Like, okay, let you know everybody on the same page yeah. keeps the heartbreak away, or at least it allows you to yeah. know how far you can let your heart play. And so, that's yeah. the only thing I would say from this story where I was screaming at the book i was like felicity girl no he like <laughs> one, from one sentence to the next he was like absolutely not and she was like i see children and i was like oh god this is this do you wanna do you wanna hear what i told leo when we were dating yes so leo okay so me and leo dear listeners he long con me into marrying him <laughs> is basically that how the story all ends but i'll give it to you so we went on a few dates and i friend zoned him because he is like too respectful and you guys probably have figured it out by now, but I am a very smutty individual. And I was like, well, if he doesn't want to, you know, like try and hug me or kiss me or something, like how are we going to get married? He's not trying to get up on this. You know what I'm saying? Not in a, not in a nasty way, but in like a respectful, like I was like, you know, leaning in for a hug. I didn't get a hug. (laughs) So I was like, well, let's just be friends because he's great. And I really had a good time with him, but I was like, let's be friends. We were friends for like six months. We hang out all the time, go to the movies, 
one of my friends was like, you're essentially dating. Like you guys go to the movies and dinner every single week, at least once, like you're dating. And I was like, no, no, we're just friends. So anyway, so then later he told me he wanted to be more than friends that he really liked me and he wanted to go on a second first date. And so I uh, told him I was willing to do it. And I said, but we're already good friends. So we have to kiss on this date. We have to hold hands and we have to hug because if those things aren't working, then like we'll just be best friends and that's okay. But if those things are working, then we can like figure out what's gonna happen. So anyways, we went on this magical second first date. The kissing was great. The hand holding was great. Everything was great. So then like literally the next day he was like, so are we like dating? And I was like, I was like, yeah, I feel like we're just like together. He's like, so you're my girlfriend? And I was like, yep. Like literally the next day I was like, yep, great. (laughs) And then we like, our parents like met each other like, I don't know, like eight months later or something like that. Like my parents flew out to meet his family and, and, but like my parents moved, flew out to meet his family. And I was like, I had told him the whole time. I was like, look, you're great. And I was like, but I am someone you marry. I'm not someone you date for five years. That's just not a thing that I do. If you want to marry me, like within a year, you need to figure it the fuck out. If you don't want to marry me within a year, you're never going to want to marry me. If you don't like, that's it. Like that's, I'm sorry, but that is my opinion. And I am a woman you marry. I am not a woman that you date for five or 10 years. And then like you guys break up. I was like, I'm not interested in that. And, uh, And so like maybe, I don't know. 10 months, he had art, he had bought the ring, but I didn't know this, but maybe like 10 months or so after we started dating, I was like, I am fucking serious. I will break up with you if you don't want to marry me. I just want you to know if you do not propose, I will break up with you. Because again, to Shawnee's point, you have to be, and you know, to his credit, he had already asked my parents, he had already bought the ring. <laughs> he was just waiting for a romantic, a romantic time when all my family is visiting for a family wedding to propose. So they would all be there. Um, that I was like, he he jokes that I was like clapping and I was like, you better hit that ring. <laughs> Which I don't think I was clapping. You were clapping. clapping you were I clapping. Did at some point. I probably did at some point. But you got to tell him that, you know, full proposed to me. And then I was like, we can get married in six months or in a year because we didn't want to get married in the summer. And he's like, let's do six months. So we got married in six months. And that was uh, four and a half years ago. That's awesome. But that that is but you gotta specificity. Say, you got to tell the people. Yes specificity. Mm-hmm. I was like, you have one year to lock this shit down or I will go find <laughs> someone else who will lock this shit down. I am down. almost certain you clapped at him when you were talking to Because I've seen I probably, you break out I those claps. Did, I, probably, I probably did at some point. I Poor Leo did. was like, I better I lock this like, down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and he had, like, already bought the ring and everything. I think that's so hilarious because, like, like, the image in my mind of him already having the ring and he's so ready and he's feeling romantic and he's waiting for the right moment. And you're like, what the fuck, man? Are you going to lock this down No, or he he loved he loved it so much. He was so proud of himself that he kept it a secret for months and that my whole family kept it yeah. from me. So everybody knew. Like, my whole extended family, all of our roommates, we lived with four <laughs> other people at the time. All of them knew. Like, everyone knew. Knew, and he was so he's still so yeah. cocky about it and proud about he it. Like, he earned it. He, he should be. It. He should be. He earned he earned it. It was a beautiful proposal at sunset on like a rooftop deck in Venice overlooking the ocean. And like my siblings were there. Like it was a magical <laughs> time. Um, he deserves fi- he got he gets five stars for, for that That's proposal amazing. for sure. So so uh just to like piggyback off, but I'll keep this short. My sister was um so adamant about getting married. She's like, I'm 33 or like whatever. I want to have a baby and I don't have no boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. She ended up falling in love with a high a college friend that she'd known for 10 years, right? And so they'd been dating a year, but she was very specific. She was like, I want to get married. Like you got a year, this and that, whatever. So the timetable is coming up. Now we all know that she's about to get engaged. He's already bought the ring and like, uh, Thanksgiving is coming up and our entire family is going to be in one place for Thanksgiving. So she gets dressed up in her cutest outfit. She goes and gets a, a, a manicure to make sure her nails are done so that the picture pictures uh. will be cute. She's like, he's going to propose during Thanksgiving. The entire family is there. And we had told him not to propose during Thanksgiving because she'll expect it. Like, because she's just uh. that kind of... Because you guys are fucking oh, evil. That's su- why. <laughs> Super evil. To break this poor Super girl's evil. heart. <laughs> so so um, what happened is we always go to Tennessee for Thanksgiving, and then um, they all live in Atlanta. So Thanksgiving, we were all in Tennessee. 
everybody like it's a magic it's the most magical time to get engaged and she and no engagement happens but she didn't know like everybody drove down to atlanta right and had decorated her mom's house and made it like really pretty and blah 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 whatever and was waiting there for her so he was there everybody i have this whole thing on film but the night before at, in tennessee she there's a video of her crying she's like i will never get engaged i, I will never grow old and no one is going to love me and what i thought tonight was my i mean she was bawling and all her friends yeah because you guys are so oh my God. mean I mean, that's so mean, Johnny. You made that girl cry. Listen, you made your sister cry. That I is wrong. Not, I blame you for this story. You're wrong for this. I was not the this. one who made the executive decision here, okay? I just Okay. Well, whoever did but, is wrong because that's brutal. But the video of her is so funny because she's surrounded by her sorority sisters, and they all know what's about to happen, and they're trying to console her, but also not give away mm-hmm. the fact that what's happening, and she's half drunk, and it's just the funniest video of all time. And, of course, the next day, she walks in super casual, not expecting anybody to be there at all. She's got, like, my little niece on her hip. And walks in, and then everybody, her sorority sisters, everybody she has ever known is in one freaking room, and she loses it. She lost her whole mind. So it was worth the surprise of her, like, really being surprised. Um, but, yeah, it was a little bit messed up, but it was it was pretty funny as, as well. <laughs> but she was awesome. definitely very specific. All right. Well, on that note, you guys... We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to tell a smutty story. I'm ready for this smutty story, Bridget. Let's hear this. Hello, best friends. Thank you for being loyal listeners of Romance at a Glance. We're so happy to have you. If you'd like to support us further, head over to Patreon, where you can become one of our patrons. We've got a lot of great perks, such as merch and a super secret discussion group, where Bridget and I talk to you directly about all things romance and all things nasty. So come on over. And now, back to our show. Shani Nani. All right, Bridget, tell me. I almost had you read book number two and just ignore book number one's existence because there is a scene where our fair heroine, Hattie, who is a great character, ties the main character, Wit, Mm. to the mast of a ship. Is he naked? Yes, she strips him naked and then goes down on him until he busts. And she's like, no, I will have my way with you. Ooh, where does he bust? Because up until this... Up until this point, he's been, you know, real stupid about the like, no, this is just for you to help you explore your pleasure. Meh, 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 isn't coming, which is meh, dumb. Meh, meh. And she's like, that's dumb. And so she's like, and then he's like, growls at her and he's like, untie me. And she's all like uncertain. because She's like, oh no, maybe I went too far. Maybe he didn't like it. And then he like pounces on her. And I was like, mm, 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 mm. Anyways, I think that you would really enjoy. First of all. Scene. Absolutely, I would really freaking enjoy that scene. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> On the note of, I don't even know how to tie this into our heroine rating to go from blowjobs to heroines, but here we are with Felicity, our heroine. And what did you think of Fair Felicity? So I was on the fence with Felicity between a three and a four. Um, okay. And the reason is because... Even though I thought she was super adventurous and I love that she was go-getting and she wasn't letting anybody, like, you know, like she went toe-to-toe with Dev. There was just two things that she did that just drove me freaking nuts. One was I found her very simpery at times, um, a little bit whiny, and I didn't enjoy that. And then I didn't enjoy when she was in delusion land of, <laughs> of like... <laughs> like we're gonna make babies and he's like we're for sure not gonna make babies we're gonna make babies <laughs> you know um, so I didn't enjoy that but I think I'm gonna round up to a four um, for her because she did redeem herself in the end when she lockpicked and got him so I think I've decided right now that she gets a four but live live, live decision live <laughs> <On> decision <podcast. laughs> like just ha- hashtag you can't change a man don't ever think you can change a man. Just understand you have to accept them for who and what they are. Now, yes. that's not to say you can't, um, what I like to call it, mind jujitsu them. Okay. Evolve a man. You evolve can evolve man. one. Yes. Once you got him. You know, yeah. like, you can, that's the thing is like, any man, my mom always said, and I pass this on, that if a man is teachable, then you can you can work with them. That means that they, if you tell them that something is wrong or whatever, they will they will stop, listen, and make adjustments. 
Like that is somebody you want. If you are dating somebody and you find they are not teachable, please let them go. Do not continue with them because your life will suck. Okay. But if they're teachable, you can work with anything. So I'm just going to put that out there for y'all. I have more to say on this, but not right now on the podcast. You want to hear about it's it? another podcast. DM me. Another podcast. DM me. Me about to do just a podcast on a teachable man because this has been the yeah. best thing my mom ever Patreon. Patreon. Teachable man. Yes. Uh, I also gave her four stars. I thought she was. Uh, I thought she was lovely. She was spunky. She had a lot of courage. Um, I liked that. Like you said, she like stood up to him. I loved her like quick wit and sharp retorts. I liked that she was always honest um, about you know kind of what was going on. And I loved that she like came to the rookery and is like, why can't I be here? I th- I think I can be here. And every time he was like, I'm too dark for you. She was like, what if I want to come into the darkness with you? Like, yeah, let me in, bro. <laughs> and uh, I liked I liked that about her. Yeah. And what did you think about our fair hero? Our handsome. Hero? I gave him a he's very handsome. I gave him a three. I feel like he easily could have been a four or five if he wasn't constantly, like we said, repeating himself over and over. And it's like, get over it, bro. Like, at the beginning when we met him, I was like, ooh, five stars, five mm-hmm. stars. I'm into this man. And yes. then, like, in the middle of the book, I was like, woof, come on, bro. Get it together. Um, you know, and so I gave him a three. I was hoping he would be closer to a four or five, but I gave him a three. I'm 100% with you for exactly what you just said. I was like, <laughs> I wrote on here, like, this back and forth uh, is no good. Uh, the whole like, ooh, you know, I want to be with you. Let me eat you out. But no, but yes, uh, tiresome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was definitely a mixed steamy, but but every time he waffled, did the whole waffly thing, it just made him like a mixed simper. Yeah. I'm like, like yo, mix steamy. She mick wants it. Mick, give it to her now, yes. please. <laughs> <laughs> I want that in a shirt. To your point, I think. I think all of their sexual encounters were good, but I, in general, like, and this is obviously a more historical thing where it's like they can't necessarily consummate before marriage. So there's a lot of like, I'm doing this just for you. Like I'm eating you out so that you have an orgasm, but then like nothing else is happening. And I'm like, yo, a lot else could happen. Yes. Like, how come we're not getting you to ejaculate? Why are there no blowjobs happening? Like, how come yes. you're not playing just the tip just for a second just to see how it feels? You know what I mean? Like, give me something. Just um, the tip is a fun game. That was that was my feelings about him and about the mixteamy the mixteaminess. Yeah. What were your favorite lines in the book? My favorite lines. Well, one is the one I read earlier about her <laughs> fantasizing mm-hmm. about them having babies. Um, <clears throat> I did like the the line that was like, "Men raised in the dark will do anything for light." She wondered if he realized how much she wanted to explore the darkness. Um, and I like this line for the reason I think most people on Goodreads like this line, which is like, yo, man, if she's asking for the darkness, give her the darkness. Like, yes, <laughs> give her the darkness and yeah. the d d d d Give it a D. Give it a D. Yes. Um, so there was actually uh, quite a few quotes in this book that I um, enjoyed. Uh, but there were are, a lot of good quotes. Yeah. Those are two one, that one that I had, which was similar to the one you just had, which was, the darkness has always tempted her. The locks, the barriers, the impossible. And I was like, Okay. okay. And then the other one, which we mentioned, but I have the actual quote was, you don't just come to see me, Felicity. Why not? I have something to discuss with you. It doesn't matter what we've things to discuss. I shall find you. You don't just turn up in the rookery. Is this a rookery? I've never been to one. <laughs> like, I just imagine her being like, like, oh, like, how come? Like, you gave yeah. me your card. I thought she wanted me to come see you. Yeah. And his brother's like, you gave her the card, but like says nothing, but just like hems at him. And I love it. <laughs> So good. I will say that I think you will really like the second book, um, because I feel like hit like you get obviously get more of them together, but without as much of the backstory and as as much heavy lifting on the um, world building since it's already established. Yeah. So I do think that you will really like it, and and the main character um, is like a really strong. Uh, strong lady. Like, speaking of the uh, book opens and she's going to the brothel that Grace owns. 
Ooh. for because she's uh, on the shelf, but she doesn't. She wants to officially ruin herself so that she can take over her father's business. Yes, and that's, so that's she's gorgeous. on her way there. I'll yeah, be and that's I'll be reading this. and that's yeah, and that's where Wit uh, he meets her. Yeah, um, and she's like, "You're not the person I asked for," and he's like, growls at her, and I'm like, "Mm mm mm, growl at me some more." <laughs> oh, I do love some growls, man. Like, mm-hmm. you know when guys are, like, super quiet during sex? I don't know who ever told them that they couldn't talk during it's sex. It's terrible. Or that they couldn't make noise. Because you, so many guys are so quiet that you know that somewhere in their life they learned that the sounds they it's make. Probably cause they're, it's probably because they're jerking it so much, trying to be quiet in their rooms, trying to be quiet in the that shower. Is, <laughs> <laughs> Motherfuckers <laughs> trying to be quiet all the time. <laughs> that's, actually, that's probably freaking true. That's probably true. Because I'm like, uh, there's uh, no way that all of you guys got this memo on being quiet. Like, how do I know that you're enjoying what I'm doing if I don't hear any noise from you? Like, should uh-huh. I stop? And they'll be like, no, no, don't stop. I know. Well, well I don't know. Yeah, I don't stop. Going. I love it. And I'm like, do you? Like, because I need directions. I, when yes. you're when you're down there, I'm telling you a little to the left, a little harder, a little sour, a little bit. Uh huh. Hey, hey, uh huh. I'm giving you, I'm giving you the clues, the cues, the verbal. Yes, but they just be mad, mad, quiet about it. And the thing of the thing also is like, I like giving blowjobs. I don't like silent blowjobs. So like for me, a silent blowjob is a chore. And a vocal blowjob is a delight. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Like, it's enticing for me because yes. then I'm like all excited because you're excited. It turns sure. me on. I'm like, oh man, turn him on. That turns me on. It's a mutual turning on of energies or whatever. But like, mm-hmm. honestly, it's like performing to to no audience if you're quiet. Like, it's just mm-hmm. the saddest thing ever. You know, it's really interesting. So my husband, he, for the longest time, like. Like, obviously, he likes bull jobs because I'm great at it. But he also <laughs> he also was in his mind because he was thinking that I didn't like it. Yeah. Because, obviously, it's not like sex where he can feel if I'm wet or something like that. And one day, I, I was like, oh, I want you to finger me while I'm giving you a blow job. And after that, like, he was so shocked. He was like, you're wet. And I was like, well, duh, this is sexy as fuck. Of course I'm wet. I'm excited. We're excited. This is dope. And he, after that, was like like so much less inhibited about it, about yeah. enjoying it. Like he didn't feel bad. Because before he was thinking, oh, this is a chore for her. She doesn't like it. And then after that, he was like, oh, she likes it too. So like I can enjoy it more. Yeah. So I think sometimes it's also like, because in, in I feel like in social, in co- like pop culture and social media and whatever, a lot of times it's like presented as a very demeaning act or in porn, like a lot of times everyone's like fucking gagging up a storm and like yeah. crying. Like the hard or, face and it, Yeah. And so I feel like it must be a mind fuck to see those things and then think, no, but I love this person or I really like this person and I want them to enjoy it. But like, this is so selfish of me to want this. Um, yeah. Which is kind of an interesting, like, boys get a mind fuck about sex, too, unfortunately. Everyone in the U.S. gets a mind fuck about it. Yeah. We're so Puritan. We're so Puritan. We're like, this is, I'm going to get off my soapbox in one second. But, like, the amount of violence that little kids animated movies have and just every other movie, it'll be like PG-13. It'll be like outrageous violence, but no yeah. blood. And then there's, like, <laughs> one boob shown, and it's, like, rated R. Yeah. I'm like... <laughs> We have a serious, serious problem. Like, this is... As a country yeah. that, like, was founded by people who were supposedly trying to get away from, you know, tyranny and, and being persecuted for beliefs and whatever, we are very mm-hmm. puritanical when it comes mm-hmm. to to certain things. And, like, yep. the idea, like, it still boggles my mind that it's illegal to show your boobs, but not illegal for men to show their chest. Because, yep. in all honesty, like... If tomorrow I decide to go to the courthouse and change my gender to uh, to male, then I don't have to actually change anything about my body. But now it becomes legal for me to show my titties, like that. Mm. That that is actually a thing. You know what I mean? So I'm like, so where? Like this doesn't make any sense. I'm living in crazy land. But that's how I feel every day. Every day that I wake up, I go, I'm living in crazy land, and I have to not engage with the world because 
Otherwise, I feel like I'm being gaslit at every turn. <laughs> Do like you feel like you constantly have to tell people that boobs are not the equivalent sex organ to a penis? Because I feel like yes. I constantly be telling people that. They're like, oh, my God, I saw your boob. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but I see your chest hair, and it's fine. Yeah. Like, your penis is the equivalent of my vagina. It is not the equivalent of my boobs. I'm like, my boobs are the equivalent <laughs> of your chest. Like, that's, yeah, that's your chest that's hair. What it is. They're, it's a secondary yeah. sex characteristic. It's just your chest hair. That's it. It's yeah. a little te- extra testosterone, a little extra. It's, it's, and I get that they're, you know, beautiful and, you know, whatever. But, yeah. like, I'm like, so is your back muscles and your forearm muscles. You yes. know what I'm saying? And forearm I'm not losing muscles, my mind over that. <laughs> forearm muscles will get me wet in a second, boy. Reach for oh something. Oh, my God. Did you Just reach did for you, something, like, please. <laughs> did you? Was that quote in this book or in the next book where she says, you know, everyone's talking about the female form and corsets and all this stuff, but has anyone ever seen a man take his coat off and do work? <laughs> Is that in this book? <laughs> I don't remember it. <laughs> so it's either in this book or in the next one, uh, the brothers are hauling ice yeah. and he like takes off his coat and he's just in his shirt, you know, white shirt sleeves with the sleeves rolled up and yeah. he's working. So it's like clinging to his back. Oof. He's all sweaty. And she's just standing there like, uh, 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 uh. she's like, who thinks women are beautiful? <laughs> This is scandalous. <laughs> Look at him. <laughs> I was like, I agree. I agree. A hundred percent. I agree, I agree all the time. I mean, I mean, I've seen movies like, you know, American Pie, stuff like that, where you'll see like a housewife watching the gardener do work. And mm-hmm. I was so young that I didn't get it. I was like, really? This is how it is? And now, having gotten to an age where my hormones kick up, and uh, sh- let, let me just let y'all know, ladies, that when you turn about <laughs> 35, there's a hormone kick up that they don't tell you about. Like I literally went to my mom who's super prudish and I was like, mom, is this a thing? And she's like, oh yeah. And when you turn 40, your sex drive is going to go even more through the roof. And I'm like, what the hell? Because I will look at a gardener. I will stare and watch like a movie, like a slow movie. I was at your house. It was your house where you had some workers come that one time. Uh, I do have, I do have work. Oh yeah. My, you the guy who did the my guy. garage was hot. Yeah. He was the super guy who hot. Did garage. <laughs> I was he was sitting, super hot. We, we had work to do and I was sitting the, on the couch just like daydreaming. Yeah. We're just he's like really, shining. really good looking. <laughs> I was like, he Ooh. was like, he was like, he's also a really nice guy. Did a great job. I gave him five stars, not for his looks, but because the work was excellent. But also, like, that man was a slice. And I was like, if I was a single lady living in this house, I would have been like, um, I have <laughs> something wrong in my house. Would you like, I'll come cook you dinner and we can talk about it. <laughs> Just see if he's open to that overture, you know. <laughs> it seems to be beautiful. Listen, beautiful if you dude. can, if you get to hire somebody who does really good work and is fine, a really good work and it's not fine. You marry that I mean, fool. Like that fool down. He gonna get every bit of business from me. Let me tell mm-hmm. you. <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's where my brain's yeah. at right now. It just wants to get pregnant. I'm just not gonna, like that's where it's at. <laughs> it's like, ooh, are you full of testosterone and uh, hot muscles? Yes, you give me strong babies. Now give me give babies. me those give me them strong babies. <laughs> give me them babies. <laughs> uh, anyway, all, all right. right. What is what did you think about this book, Shani? Okay, what's your so, star rating? Talk to me. Okay, well, let me give you my review first. Um, this is from... Oh, ha, ha, I totally forgot about our reviews. What was your favorite <laughs> review? <laughs> uh, my favorite review was from Stacy. is Sassy. And she rated it three stars. And she said, are we there yet? I like Wicked and the Wallflower, but to be honest, it dragged for me. It took me way too long to get through the story, and I normally devour anything Sarah McLean writes. I think my biggest problem was that I never really connected with the characters. I thought the heroine was a ninny. The hero, not as tough, strong, intimidating as I was told. And the villain, a little bit insipid. Harsh, I know, but I need more from them. I just didn't feel part of the story and never felt a desperate need to keep going. And so, um, I'm with Stacy on this. So, I separated my brain into, like what was actually happening in the story, what I liked, and this and that. But overall, this is kind of how I felt um, about about it. Like, there were so many times that I could have stopped reading the story and not had the great urge to pick it back up, um, especially when it was dragging and when he they kept going back and forth. I was like, I'm over this. I'm over this whole back and forth game. That happened all the way to the end of the book. Um, and I didn't enjoy that that it did. Um, again, I didn't think that the hero 
was uh, he didn't have the machismo that I really wanted him to have. I didn't he didn't have that testosterone like halt like uh that I really wanted. He got really kind of he got kind of whiny very quickly. You know, there's only one good scene to me or maybe one or two where he was the boss of shit. And then after mm-hmm. that, like it just went downhill. And same thing with Ewan. I, I there wasn't much to him in this book whatsoever. Um, and he did kind of just come off as like, I don't know, blah. So uh, I thought this was the the best rating. I I was in between a three and a four in general for the book because I do think a lot of people will like this book. Um, but I think for me it falls, I think I will have to fall at a three. Um, but it was actually, it was difficult. It was like in that 3.5 range, but I felt, felt like I was closer to a three than a four in my 3.5. That's fair. Mine was from Jean, and she rated it four stars. And she said, I was wobbly at first because the love interest lies to the leading lady, but I loved the world of the barrel nickel bastards. By the end, I was cheering for the couple and looking forward to the next book. I really like The Beast. And yeah. that is basically exactly how I felt. Like, the beginning, I was like, okay. And then once I got into it, I was like, ooh, I love the, like, under— I love any book where there's, like— a- an underworld yeah. that has its own set of rules. Like yes. when John Wick came out, I was like, oh my God, this is my, first of all, Keanu. Secondly, Keanu. a world that has all of these weird rules with the coins. And I was like, that is my goddamn catnip. So I was all for it. Um, and like she said, like I was down for the couple. I completely agree with the waffling back and forth, um, which is why it wasn't five stars. Um, but I, I, was really looking forward to the next book and I really liked it when I read it. So I also uh, gave it uh, four stars. I think four that stars. what you said at the end there, like I'm looking forward to the beast. I actually really am. So I would read more of uh, the series. Um, yeah. And I definitely wanted to read about wit. Like I, yes. as I'm reading this book and to be fair to this book, right? It is the first in the series. And so it is a setup book. So you're right. always going to have a bit of a drag in a setup book, unless you're just a, a most spectacular author of all time. Um, there's just a lot of information that you're trying to give people. I do mm-hmm. think that you could spread some of this information out across some books and have edited out a little bit of the description of things. Um, but I am so looking forward to Wit. I was looking forward to him as soon as he was introduced. I was like, mm-hmm. a beast? You know I love a beast. I'm looking forward yeah. to all the rage beasts in our fantasy season, you know, our paranormal season, because I love a rage beast in general. But I just love a big fool. Like, I just love a big dude who just, like, can just enrapture you, Bridget, and lift you, especially when you're a big girl. When you're a big girl, you want to be lifted. You want someone to make you feel tiny. You know what I'm saying? You're going to love Book, too. She's a big lady. And he lifts her up, and it's glorious. Oh, oh. I I swear, I almost had us read book two. I was like, does she even need book one? But there's, like you said, there's so much in this book. I don't really feel like you would have cared as much about wit if you didn't read this book. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I got to to long for him in this book so that book two. But let's talk about it on Patreon. Patreon Patreon.com forward slash romance at a glance. We're going to do a review once Shawnee reads the second book. Uh, We'll post it up on Patreon. You guys can see what Shawnee thought about the tying up to the mask scene I'm down. and just about beast meeting his equal also i'm, I'm totally down yeah it's happening i am excited as shawnee mentioned we are on the hunt for our season five books so we are doing a mashup of holidays so we are looking for some excellent paranormal romances preferably very smutty preferably with some big dudes who are gonna be maybe like made it at first sight they're yes. gonna be growly they're mm-hmm. gonna be all domineering yes mm-hmm. primal yes. baby primal primal babies mm-hmm. then we need some suspense we need some of our navy seals we need some action jackson we need those fools who are just on a dangerous mission but finding time to bone so much danger <laughs> so much boning <laughs> Following up, we have a Thanksgiving with the down home country boys. We need some cowboys. We need some small towns. Yeah. We need some sweet, sweet loving. Mm-hmm. And if you've got a great Christmas novella that you love, or a great Christmas book that you love, historical or contemporary, or even, you know what, if you can find us a Christmas paranormal, yes. We will send you something in the mail. I will tell you right now, I will send you something in the mail. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what we're doing next. So if you guys have, you know, things that you want us to do, leave a review and drop your book 
on Apple Podcasts or hit us up on the old Insta and let us know. Absolutely. Well, Bridget, I think that's all we have for the folks today. That's all she wrote. That's all she wrote. So until next time, Romance Besties, we love you. We're happy you're here. And may your books be your lover. And your hand, your best friend. Yowsters! Thanks for hanging in with us, Romance Readers. Head over to Instagram to continue chatting with us. We're super friendly. We want to cackle with you. We want to know what your favorite sex scene was. And we need more book recommendations. If you want to read along with us, go to our website, romanceataglance.com, to see what we're reading next. And we'll see you next podcast. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our channel to get new episodes, clips, and more. And click here to watch our previous reviews and author interviews.